welcome to Timeless Conversations today. My guest is a gentleman who is an epitome of altruism. All the while that I've known him, he has always done stuff just for the common good of everybody around him. In fact, to the extent that I see him as Dr. Selfless. I say Dr. Selfless because he's a medical doctor by training. Please welcome with me Dr. Dokun Adedeji. He prefers to be called Dokun Adedeji. That's right. <laughs> welcome. Thank you very much. We also call him Papa. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's talk about you as the person as much as possible. I will make you talk about things you don't want to talk about. You don't like being the focus. Mm. But how would you not be the focus when you are the firstborn of your family? Mm. Yeah, truly, I'm firstborn. But sometimes the firstborn also can be silent in the sense that um, others outshine him or something. Mm. But I've lived my life like this. Um, my kid brothers and sisters looking up to me again and also my parents having so much trust and confidence in my leadership ability mm. over my kids and I think that has helped me in other things that I've done I've been able to do. Okay. Your family is from Ibarodo. No, Ibaroke. Yes. In Ondo State. Yes. Were you born there? I wasn't. But you also have a very strong connection to Ibarodo. Oh, yeah. Ibaro okay. you, you know, you think, when my father retired yes. and we were living in Lagos, after a while he got out, I was living in Lagos. He moved to Ibarro okay, and then my mother joined, and they were living there until they died. So mm -hmm. we had no choice than to keep visiting uh, them until my mom died uh, uh, some months ago. Yes. So, uh, and they have their house there, uh, which is still there. And then um, we're also close to some of the things they do there. Mm -hmm. And the current Oba, mm -hmm. who are also close to him. So in a sense, because of my parents, we had to be good in regular. And that was how I got a bit close <laughs> to him. <laughs> so, so, okay. Now, but let, let's talk about your family life, your early childhood. What did your dad and your mom do that oh, oh. was useful, helpful in turning you guys out the way you have turned out? You know, I, I like that because I'm beginning to see the effect of how we were brought up and mm. what they did on our own current lives and the way we are trying to live our family lives. Mm. My father was a banker mm. until he retired during the Mutala Muhammad, some, some funny thing mm. as we learned. And then my mom actually did not work mm. because my father said her responsibility was us. Mm. And she also took it like that until... When she decided to work, then she was doing just some trading, got involved in a lot of things. So she had time to be with us. My father too managed to find time to go. And banking then, it's not like today. Mm. We had, it's like cost world and then all kinds of stuff. My father still had time. So that whenever I came back, I remember in those days, we would sit down as a family, we were talking generally about things. And those things that we used to talk about, had been some sort of a thing that have guided the way we all have grown up mm. about values, about systems, about how people should connect with other people and how they connected with us and how we saw them connecting with just ordinary people. Okay. So what was the decision to send you to school back in, uh, that was uh, a doikiti. I remember. <laughs> were, you, just... were you that stubborn? No, that... I wasn't. You see, we were living in Lagos. Mm -hmm. I did all my primary school and all those in, in Lagos. And my parents felt that they wanted me to have a kind of rural background mm -hmm. with education being the primary focus and also the Christian nature of it. So I did a variety of exams, I passed them. When I now decided I was going to go to some particular, they said, sorry, you are going to Christ school, I do a mm -hmm. And I think it was the best choice for me as well. Okay. And leaving Lagos, the glamour of Lagos and all the rascality, to then go to Christ school, <laughs> that was back water kind of a thing. And then, although again, I got there meeting some friends of mine who also came from Lagos with the same parental dignity mm -hmm. that, mm, we want you to go somewhere and learn about other people, other things aside from Lagos. Okay. So it, it, it was fun. What did that do to you? 
Ah. Apart from the fun aspect of it. No, he... Being away for the first time? Being away for the first time was tough. Mm. I remember the first time that we were on holiday, I was to come home. Um, I think my, my dad could send someone to pick me or something, so I had to come by public transport or something. So for me, it was jarring. Never mm. done that before. Mm. And also what it helped me to do was to meet a lot of people okay. from different backgrounds. And in those days, it, it, wasn't, it doesn't matter whether we were Christian or not. I, mean, I met all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. And also it allowed me to settle into education mm. and also gave me the opportunity of going to some extracurricular things that had built my life today. It was a very good experience for me. So what led you to decide to read medicine? To read medicine? Uh, to be honest with you, I'm being, and I try to be as modest as possible. I was good in mm. all the subjects. I was very good. I was one of the best in my class in my school at the time. So for me, and again, you know those days, if you were not a doctor you or, were something, a lawyer or something, or a lawyer or an accountant, and truly, if I didn't read medicine, I would have read law. Okay. And so I decided to read, and again... So it wasn't like your dad insisted no, you no, were no. to read? Because, you know, it was like in those days, those they would days, say, no. this is what you read. You see, I think my family had been lucky with the kind of parents we had. None of us was mandated or corralled to read a particular it was by choice mm. and um, i think some of the things that guided me i remember when we were living in ibadan mm. and i was to make a choice i remember my dad's friend two of them very well one was professor femi williams mm -hmm. he was pathologist in luth uh, in uch and then i was professor shofora mm. who was also in uch and they were my dad's very close friend they used to come and I saw Professor William, I remember him very well. He would wear black trousers, white short sleeve with a black bow tie. Mm -hmm. And I liked that. He was very well and very intelligent man. And from school, from I passed all this, I just said I was going to read medicine. So you wanted to become another family Williams? In a sense, in mm -hmm. terms of the way it was sartorially presented and very intelligent and very professional. You also dress very well too, so sure you know. Oh, I thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. No, people say that. But yes. It's just uh, by nature, I like to be simple, but I like to be. I'm very meticulous about mm. the things that I do. Okay. Even dressing, even writing, whatever I do. Um, so people find a bit of trouble with that. Mm. I was too particular mm -hmm. about things, but it's just my nature. Mm. So it's been how many years since you left Ife? Mm. I mean, yes, since you went to. Medicine. Medicine, yes. I, I left medical school, I think it must have been about 38 years now. Yeah, that's right. almost 40 years. Oh, yes. yes. And I practiced medicine for quite a while until I got tired. I was, I was in Cadbury. Mm. So, and incidentally, you know, things sometimes work in ways that you don't understand but that you desire. Mm -hmm. uh, after I've been in medical practice in, in, uh, as a medical director in Cadbury, then I was getting tired of medicine. I said to myself, I would rather do something else. So in the process, Cadbury then had an issue. And then the MD then, a white man, thank God for white men, mm -hmm. I, I mean for this reason, mm -hmm. he called me and said, eh, we talked about something in the company because of the issue where all the directors had gone. And they want me to move to human resources, to head human resources. So I said to him, hey, I'm a doctor. So he said, no, we know. But we know that you can do it. We will give you all the practical background that you need, experience, and then we'll put you. So he said, okay, they'll come in. Let me have an interview with the other directors who are white too. I keep mentioning the white thing because I'm not sure if the MD was black or Nigerian, whether they'll give me that opportunity. That's a deep one. Honestly. We will interrogate it. Oh, please, let's do. Uh, you know why I'm saying so? Yes. This was a man, they brought him because he had retired, they brought him from the UK. Okay. Uh, Wallace Galland. I remember his name very well. Cadbury had had problems, some white people had come on the board. Alistair, Alistair was there, Mike was there, and I think, and also Wallace. So he walked to my office, actually in the clinic. Hmm. He had been looking for me, I wasn't there. So then he then came, he shut the door and said, Look, I want us to have a chat. I said, What is it? 
They said, we've been thinking about something. I've discussed with them in headquarters in Birmingham. We want you to become the head of HR. I said, look, I'm a medical doctor by profession. He said, we know. But we have seen things in you that can make you be, that make us believe mm -hmm. that you can handle it. So, but he said, what they will do then is try and give me practical background and all this and all the training required. I said, okay. And he said, I will think about it that he will call me. So he got back to him, he called me and said, will I be available for an interview on Friday? I said, okay, fine. Then he called back and said, no, tomorrow. So I met the other directors, two of them, Mike, uh, the other white man, then the South African, who were white South African, uh, Alistair, Alistair Gore. So we had the interview, and then two days later, they called me and said, look, they've agreed that I should be moved to human resources, that if I don't like it, I should let them now come back to medicine. We'll come back to it. Let me just say that, don't you think that attitude was more from where they're coming from than because of their skin color. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, if, I, if I alluded to white, it was yes. because they were white then. Well. I think it's them. Yeah. It's just their way, the attitude of giving anybody a chance who mm -hmm. can do something. Not necessarily because of the skin color. Okay, fine. It is not unlikely that there could be some Nigerians with such disposition. Mm -hmm. But at that time, there was none there was none. in okay, my periphery. Okay. So I think it was more. It wasn't because of their, oh, now, some also came, they were terrible, okay. uh, white guys, but not necessarily because of their skin color. So what was that experience like, switching from the clinic being medical director to becoming HR director? Honestly, it was enlightening. It, was, it gave me a wider bath mm -hmm. in understanding. Uh, but you see, what had also helped me was the fact that as a doctor, I was t dealing with human beings in a clinical sense mm -hmm. of mobility. Yeah. But when I moved it, I was, I was now dealing with human beings in a social environment with their working relationship and all that department. So it was just a shift, but it's still about people. Okay. I, but I think it deepened my interest in people right. and gave me a better understanding of what trips people, how they live their lives and what affects them. I, it was very good for me. And after a while again, I got tired. I said I wanted to leave. Hmm. We'll take a break. Out. We'll, we'll be back to continue. Hmm. It's still timeless conversations. Our guest is Dr. Dukun Adedeji. We'll be back. <music> Welcome back to Timeless Conversations with Dukun Adedeji as our guest today. So you were saying you got tired and you thought, let me go. You, you, you see, it's an interesting thing about what had happened to me. When I was in the clinic, oh, I, I had the liberty to do meds, to practice medicine the way I always love to practice. I had everything. The company gave me the latitude to have the things that I required to practice. And so it was a different experience for me from working in the private sector. And so when I was, after a while, I just saw, I come here, I treat people, I do this, I can't wait for the day. Mm. So I said to myself, I'd like to have a different experience. You know, and the thing that helped me, as the clinic was under the HR department, mm. so I was attending top managers meeting and all those. So I was making contributions to our discussions, and I saw that, look, this is something that I didn't think I was going to go to HR until that opportunity came. So when it came, you know what? I was even in the clinic. I was involved in some NGOs mm -hmm. where I put so much time and interest even while working. Um, and so I began to say to myself, and I came with the experience of what Bill Gates said. Bill Gates said when he called his colleagues and said, look, when he, became, he becomes 50, he was going to retire. And he began to do other things that gave him satisfaction and opportunities to do other things. So I said to myself, I've worked in the clinic, I've been HR, I've done my bit. I would like to spend the rest of my life doing things for other people and doing things that I enjoy, not necessarily for money, hmm. but for satisfaction. And so after a while, I told the company that I would like to leave. So they said, well, I said, I just was tired. There was no way I would become the MD of the company. I mean, going by what I can see, because I'm limited in that scope. Mm -hmm. And I'd rather 
now when I can still do stuff, go and do things. And I, they said, okay, fine. So I left. And since I left, I've been involved with the NGOs that I mentioned that are now I should pretend to buy it. Mm. And it gives me absolute satisfaction. Mm. And um, the peace it brings to me, I can't quantify it. So I, I thought I made the right uh, decision. So it's like you turned the page oh, yes. in your life's story. Oh, yes. And decided I'm going to be more into NGO uh, social service, as mm -hmm. it were. Mm -hmm. Now, the NGO is the Christ Against uh, Drug, Drug Abuse Ministry. Abuse ministry. That's CADAM. CADAM. Um, what informed its formation? <laughs> you know, sometimes I remember when I won an award and the chairman of the company, because I won the chairman's award in Cadbury, which mm -hmm. was a, an international award, Cadbury staff worldwide. So the chairman asked me, he said, Doku, what gave you this desire to do this thing? That I said, honestly, I don't know. I just think it's my nature. It's not the same thing. What happened was I never smoked before, never drank before. One day in church, the pastor just said, look, we are starting a new ministry called Drug Addict Reaction Ministry to cater to the people that have been on drugs, maybe in the hospital at home. They didn't have any intention of turning to anything else, so I joined. So once I was there, it then began, not because of my medical background, but it was just my nature. So when we were there, I began to suggest a few that, look, going to the joints and meeting this addict, just talking to them was not, they even said to us that, look, we want you to take us out of this mm. and then put us in a place where we can get rehabilitated. That was what began the journey. Mm. So I then got very involved in it. We then built our center, we began to admit people, and we went to see people turn around. There are quite a number of them that are still, a lot of them that are drug free, living in productive lives. So that was our, my interest. And what year was this? Um, the ministry actually yes. was founded by Pastor Deyemi. I mm -hmm. think he founded the ministry in 1991. Okay. And then I joined the ministry in 1992. So that's like uh, 1991 30. today. That's 30 years yes, ago. Yes, and then so 29. You've been with it. <coughs> I've been in the ministry for about 29, 29 years. years. And since I retired in 2010, yes. this is what I've been doing full time. Mm. Even I wasn't paid. Mm. But that was not until now God, uh, Mommy Joe now set up a board. The board said no. You couldn't have been doing this all these many years and then we don't, so they said they'll give me some allowance, but the allowance is not even the important thing. But the fact that it was touching people's lives, people's homes, mm -hmm. people's families and parents. Let's talk about uh, not just the testimonials yet, mm -hmm. but the drug abuse situation mm -hmm. in Nigeria. <coughs> I know it's a global thing, but let's situate it within our own area. Um, Leko, one of the greatest tragedy for me, or pain for me, is the issue and our attitude to substance abuse in Nigeria. Why do I say that? Since I got involved, we've been shouting at what I'm seeing that we envelope. And when it initially, some years ago, they said Nigeria was a user nation, uh, a transit nation, or oh, people carry, they carry through Nigeria. I remember telling one of the top echelons of uh, NDLA, was actually the chairman, and that we were joking that then we were even a user nation. But they didn't believe until 2013, when NDLA finally agreed that we were a user nation. Then I cautioned again, a year or that after that, we are not just a user, we are a manufacturing nation. Everybody said, no, no, it can't be. Where am I going to? In 2017, a survey was done by the UNODC. The report came out in 2018. The global prevalence, the global average prevalence use of substance abuse globally was 5.6%. Mm. In Nigeria at that time was 14.4%. Mm. Translating to over 14 million Nigerians between ages 15 and 64 that had used drugs the previous year. And let me say this, that survey <clears throat> probably did not take into cognizance people who do it in the office. People who do it socially, people, these were people they thought that were doing drugs on a regular basis. Mm. This year, 
the country representative of UNODC said that figure is close to 20 million. And you know, the thing that people also need to know is that out of every four substance use abuse disorders, one is a female mm. in Nigeria. The preponderance of use in Nigeria in the population is age 25 to 39, which is the economic productive year of yeah. any nation. Yeah. In Nigeria today, over almost 12 million people use cannabis. Marijuana? Marijuana. And I can tell you, Leko, there is no area of this country that does not have a drug joint. Freeze. Freeze. Mm. Marijuana. <coughs> they say that the marijuana grown in certain parts of Nigeria, mm. right, is the best in the world. Mm. When you say is the best in the world, mm -hmm. is there any economic opportunities derivable from that? Because I recall mm -hmm. that even Governor Kedolu is calling for the legalization of marijuana production. You know why I'm laughing? Incidentally, yeah. Governor Kedolu and I were classmates oh. <coughs> at Ayoto. Yes. We're very good friends. He knows this is what I do. I disagree with him completely. You see, anybody who talks about legalization of marijuana are blinded to some facts. Mm. We know as a matter of fact that the marijuana grown in Nigeria, the component THC component that is the terrible one that affects the mental and disturbed people is very high. You see, the marijuana grown abroad for the legal uses are modified. Mm. So, they modified to say that the TAC component is not as heavy as it is here. To say that the best in Nigeria is a fallacy. Mm. Nigeria is the fifth highest user producer of marijuana in the world. Now, the thing about this is we are not in a state yet, and I don't know when we can get there, when we can sort of decide that this is what we use marijuana for. So legalizing it, it will be a tragedy. It will take us down slope. And I'm glad that General Mara has spoken against it, as many of us are against it. We need to be very careful. Yes, economic benefits are there. Because we know that uh, within marijuana, there are over a hundred and something substances or compounds in it. And many, some of them are used in the manufacturing, they're used in building, they're used in hair industry. Yeah, hair products beauties and all those things. They also use in medicine. But one thing that people forget, even the medi medical marijuana mm. is not an answer to many of the conditions we use them for. In infantile epilepsy, for instance, which sometimes it is you, it is not everyone that has infantile epilepsy that benefits mm. from marijuana. And we have also known that regular drugs that are used for those conditions are far more efficacious than even marijuana. Mm. Trying to legalize it and under the guise of the legal use is just to make it into something that becomes acceptable. If we're not careful, mm. marijuana we just the class, we join the class of socially acceptable substances mm. like alcohol and cigarette. And it's becoming like that in Nigeria surreptitiously. Yes. Because a lot of people use marijuana. And you know one thing that I'd like to say is this. There are very, very varieties of marijuana, various ones that people are now using in Nigeria. They call it loud. They call it Arizona. They call it Colorado. Mm -hmm. They are not marijuana at all. What about the one they call skunk? Skunk is different. Okay. Uh, uh, skunk is, let me take that and then I'll go back. Yeah. Skunk is a combination of marijuana, dry leaves of purple, mm -hmm. and then cocaine. Mm. That is why when people begin to use skunk, they begin to have a tendency towards addiction because okay. of the cocaine element okay. and then they all you see and it's more expensive they give a reason to say well because it's higher in potency and that's why people use it and it's cheap it's, it's more expensive than ordinary marijuana mm. maybe ordinary marijuana five rounds may cost about 100 naira or thereabout but skunk a pinch of skunk may cost you 2000 mm. or thereabout but if i go back to colorado yeah. and arizona yeah we know that in those substances, which is not marijuana in itself, 
the marijuana component of them is about 10 to 11 percent. Mm. The rest is made of chemicals oh, no. and herbs. And that is why when you see people use it, they can go berserk. Yeah. They will begin to. It is the element, it is not the marijuana element, it is very low. It is the chemical component. There are synthetic marijuana. Mm. And that is what is common to them. Why people use them is because the smell does not have the peculiar smell of marijuana. So if you use it at home, parents may not know. But what brings it out is the effects and consequences. Mm. And those are things I, I, we, we need to do something about the substance. You know, you use. said that um, marijuana, unfortunately, was mm. becoming, or sadly, was becoming uh, surreptitiously a socially acceptable mm. drug. I recall that growing up, Joints where they sold or smoked marijuana were not very much welcome within residential areas, oh, yeah. right? But these days, mm. sadly, mm. people smoke marijuana on the street, mm. openly, mm. even people in uniform. Mm. You, you know, that, you see, the thing is, dealing with the issue of substance abuse in Nigeria, needs strategic thinking and implementation. And to be honest with you, I'm glad that General Mara has come to become the chairman of NDLA. He was chairman of PASIDA. Mm. And in the process, he had, he met with a lot of stakeholders. So he had a very good understanding of what the issues are. And I think it's beginning to unfold. My fear is, I hope, they give the there's a political will to help him and also the resources. Mm. In the sense that one of the things we must begin to do in Nigeria is look at the NDLA proper. This, the law setting it up has to be reviewed in my own understanding. Is the is too omnibus. Mm. What they're trying to do, this, this, this. If we don't begin to particularize their area of attention, yes, it's good. They can be doing the interdiction, catching people and all the rest. But we need to place emphasis on demand reduction. If we don't do that, because one of the things that the um, Europeans have un understood is this. They give us a lot of gadgets to catch people at the airport. You can't carry the drug. So what happens to the drug that doesn't go out? They get domesticated. Mm -hmm. And if they get domesticated, it allows accessibility and availability on different scales. So people can get it. They can use it. So. The thing we must begin to look at now is how do we look at this thing? As you said, I doubt if you walk down this road that you won't find where you can buy it. Mm -hmm. And it's not limited to motor. You see, the, the, the wrong impression we've always had. We thought people who do drugs are motor park boys, rascals. It's not true. Mm -hmm. Big people, I mean, some experiences we are seeing lately have mm -hmm. shown us that big people do. If you want to see some of these things in some areas of like secluded areas of Lagos, high brow areas, is to watch during break time. Mm -hmm. When you see, what do they call, yuppies, mm -hmm. leave their offices in suit and everything, you see them drive to a house. They're not going there to have, just sit down. There's something that's going to happen there. Many of the parties today that are high brow are drug, are drug fed. So we, we need to be aware, and you probably also have noticed or seen from when they has done, many of the cookies, many of these things are bought online. People are, are making drugs and putting them in food materials and selling them to young people. And so that's why we, we, we need to worry. And when you talk about tackling it and about the availability, look, whether highbrow, or anywhere in Lagos, there's no place, there's no joint. You know, that's something that's uh, very scary. Mm. Uh, you said there's possibly nowhere in Nigeria, mm. no part of Nigeria mm. where there is no joint, drug mm. joint. Mm. What I have found is that <coughs> even the drug of use, the preferred drug of use, differs from Place region to, to region. Absolutely. So that's like a hydra-headed problem. Good. You, you know, you've just told us something that I'd like to elaborate. You know, in Kadam, mm. we sat down and looked at the spectrum of the things available, and then we came to a classification. 
four groups. The first one is socially acceptable, alcohol and cigarette. Go and check today. There is no alcohol you will not find in sachet. And why do they put it in sachet? The man who cannot buy the bottle can buy the sachet. The sachet is about 20 naira. So when you go to the drug, you see them buy like two of them, use it, raise the amount, put it out, and then begin to use the drug of that day. And then so it allows students to buy it. And then let's go to the next one, which is the illicit, mm. illicit classification, which everybody knows. Heroin, cocaine, marijuana, skunk, and all, and those, all of them. And all of them. Illegal, illicit because they're illegal. You can't carry them on your person and then take them, you'll be caught. And then the, sec the third one is prescription drugs. Mm. Something like tramadol, mm. something like refnol, mm. something like valium, Codeine. something like injection for intrasuzine. These are drugs that are prescribed in hospitals for moderate to severe cases of pain. Mm. One of the things we're beginning to find that is scary, and I'm talking very responsibly, because they have been called to come and intervene. The, there's a particular drug called injection pentasuzine, which is you can get on the counter, they call it for twin. It's a painkiller, which is usually used for sicklers, which has been corruptly used carelessly for sicklers. If you give pentasuzine to someone, in five minutes the pain will disappear. You will see and say, hey, there's no pain. So it's become common because you can get it everywhere. Doctors, nurses, are also beginning to abuse it. Mm. And also things like pethidine, drugs you can get in the hospital. I mean, refnol is a drug of prescription that people get. Most of these, all these drugs that I mentioned, you can get them across the counter in Nigeria. Prescription. So that's the third category. The, fair, the scary one is the fourth category. Mm. We call them miscellaneous. Mm. Why do we say miscellaneous? Because you can't classify them as drugs. Petrol. Nail polish remover, Whoa. gum, a vote stick, something like toilet fumes, pit latrine, or if a non flowing gutter, mm. the stuff are taken, are built into a mold and put fire to it, and then they inhale it. I even, you see, this is not localized to Nigeria. I saw it in Kenya when I visited Kenya some years ago. Some young, you know, when you see people go to Dung Hill. Mm. to begin scavenge, to scavenge, you watch some of them. Mm. They will sit down, put fire to it, and stand around it. The fumes that come out produce something like methane, mm. which is also something that they inhale. So that is why we should worry, just as you said. If I can't afford cocaine, I will afford something in that category that gives the same effect in lesser category. And then lizard dung. People will gather the white part of the lizard dung, grind it, and then put fire to it or sniff it. Oh, no. And so, in, in around Pakistan, Eastern um, Asia, they use scorpion. They will kill scorpion, dry it, and then use it to see. In Nigeria, here, there's something called gegemu. Hmm. You may not know it. Is People in the villages know it. There is a natural growing plant that they plant behind the house to drive snake. Huh. It has fruit. How people, how students knew that it could get them high, I don't know. It was one of the universities that I went to in Nigeria, in Southwest, yeah. that told me they will pluck the leaves, they will boil it as if they boil vegetable. You can't take the fluid need, extremely potent. So they put it in bottles. When you go, then they go to parties, they'll be giving you a bit, a bit, a bit. The fruit, they would pluck it, dry it, grind it, either sniff it or put it in alcohol. So when you talk about, so there are the different areas. We know that in some places, they put some of this is in AC. What? So when people, oh yes, AC vent. So that's why you see them, they have their closed parties. They can't do this, so they get high. But what does that getting high do to them or do for them? It, it's a, it's a, I will call it an escape mechanism without them knowing it. Because what they mean is, when I do this, truly, there's a high that comes with sniffing or taking these things. And the high is ephemeral. Mm. What do I mean by that? You take it, 
It makes you feel, oh, I'm on top of the world. Your, your problems, your pain seem to disappear. But it's like a Mexican story. A man carried a lot of load on his head. And he said, let me rest. He put it and he sleeps. And when he wakes up, what does he do? He picks up his load. It's the same thing with addiction. He gives a kind of freedom. I'm taking it. I feel hard. But the problem you are running away from, don't decide, they don't disappear because you're taking something. No. When you wake up, you pick up your problem. Right away. So unless people begin. You see, there's a lot of work to do about getting people to understand why they should not get high well, at all. I'll come back to that lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. Let's just take a short break now, mm -hmm. and then we'll continue. Mm -hmm. We're going on a break now. Welcome back from that break. It's still timeless conversations with Dokun Adedeji, my guest. Yes, we we're talking about drug abuse, the prevalence of drug abuse. And you were alluding to how it is so widespread, the four categories. Mm. What's the way out? You know, it, honestly, I'm not as pessimistic as some people think about this issue of substance that we can't get out. We can't get out. Yeah. But it takes complementary effort. Mm. And for us to understand that it is not any DNA stuff mm. or NAPDAC stuff alone, you know. Okay. It's about all of us. And I'll tell you how and why. To start drugs, many times we find out it starts from the home. Mm. I'm not saying that every home that has a problem, their children will take drugs, no. Mm -hmm. But it gives them a... It's like, so, uh, yes, a there, there's, there's something. There's something there's that a gravitation. Pushes, absolutely that then pushes them to take it. The thing is, primarily, that I say today is parents must be parents again. Mm. You and I grew up in a society that it takes a village to train a child. Yeah. Your neighbor can first of all pull you by the air and bring you to your parents. No, flog you mean. And flog, flog you. Yes. And then still bring you to your parents and parents and will flog, you, flog you. Yes. It doesn't happen today. Yeah. Yeah. Parents go to schools to mm. beat up teachers. Mm. What are you telling the child? You can get it with blue mother. Mm -hmm. Many parents don't know their children. Yeah. They, because they are in economic pursuit of happiness, mm. in quotes, everybody wants to walk. Everyone wants to be like the Joneses. You see, there's something that I tell people. You know, in psychology, there are three psychological components of the human person. Mm -hmm. The id, the ego, this. Many of us, no matter the level we get to, still suffer from deficit in ego. And the ego is, who am I? Many of us don't know who we are. We have not sat down to say, who am I? Mm -hmm. What is my purpose on earth? I didn't just get born because I want to be a part of a number. There has to be something for me particular or specific that I need to do to excel in that makes me feel confident about who I am. Mm. That's why you see people want to be like somebody else. Yes. You know, Wale Shinka says to him, he said, a tiger does not need to proclaim his tiger to you. At all. A tiger is a tiger. Yeah. And you know, people forget that no matter your, your, your disposition, you are also prone to success. They are very good barbers, mm -hmm. very good tailors, mm. very good different things. But the society has shifted focus. Mm. And generally, we all have lost focus, even the church. Mm. What does the church talk about today? Money. Prosperity. Prosperity. Mm. How can you prosper when you have not labored? Mm -hmm. And then you, you, the kind of teaching that the Bible says is not the application of what the pastors say today. Oh, no, you actually see, you hear church members say that, oh, that brother is driving a Mercedes Benz. I, I claim, I claim it. it. Claim what? Claim what? what? Did do you, you claim the problems that came with it? With too? it? And do you know how he got his Benz? Yes. You know, until we train our children, as I said to you, my father used to sit with us and talk. My father never talked about money. Mm. Money is good, but he talked about values. Mm -hmm. And you see, I think you about say when you are on the road, you are pursuing money or something, and you meet honor on the road. Yes, no. so that, you that, better take the you honor. You better take the honor because yeah. money will come with the honor. Yeah. But you see, we are pursuing money at the detriment of honor and value. What is wrong with our society today? 
Look at it. We blame the young people for this. It's not true. Mm. What do they see? What examples? Who are the role models for young people today? Mm. Absent. Mm. The people they see are the hooligans that the media will promote, mm -hmm. put them on pages and flash them up. Yeah. Do they talk about people like Dr. Koradi? Yeah. Do they talk about the lady who found money at the airport and returned I it? Returned it yeah. Or the, there was a boy I read lately in Uniben mm. who did something and the, the, the dean had to recognize it. The guy couldn't pay his school fees. He found money. He returned it that would have paid the school fees. Do we talk about them? Mm -hmm. Does social media carry those kind of stories? Yeah. No. Mm. We carry the story of somebody who just, all these Yahoo boys. Yes. Somebody who came into huge money, money. all of a sudden. All of a sudden. Yeah. And then nobody, even parents. Mm -hmm. don't. So when you look at the issue of drugs, it's all those things. So if we're going to deal with it, we have to deal, it, deal with it in a manner that parents don't understand what their roles are. And then the society also knows. You know, the problem with society is we're too quick to judge. Mm. We never give second chances to people. People that you read about, biographies and everything, if the world didn't give them second chances, look at Obama. Yes. If you read the story, you will know this is a classical story of somebody who would have this state. Mm -hmm. Look at who he became. Yeah. We don't talk to our children about those things. I just read a book lately called Beautiful Things mm. on drugs, written by Joe Biden's son, Hunter yes. Biden. Yeah. If, you, if any parent read that book, they should have a different paradigm shift as to how to deal with their children. In all the issues and all the years of addiction, Joe Biden and his wife, Jill, never derided this boy, never denounced him and threw him out of the house. They just said, we will stand with you. And he wrote it in the book. Those were some of the elements that kept him. So, so the society must begin to understand this vice is grew out of our own situation. We all together must work together to help these people. I know that there's a huge prevalence of drug uh, use mm. amongst the very young uh, mm. generation, mm. especially university students. Mm. What's the relationship between CADAM and the universities, um, both private and... Uh, most private. Usually, our relationship is, is stronger with private universities, and particularly the Christian universities. Okay. One started with us and saw the result, and the others learned from them. And we also now wrote in order to help the students, because many universities, out of ignorance, were expelling students. The final year, and we say to them, that is counterproductive, mm -hmm. which is one of the things that General Manwa is now talking about. The first attempt in helping should not be punitive. We should not punish users because they are victims. Mm -hmm. So that is double geopardy. So we wrote to the universities and said, look, we will be willing to help you. Come and visit us and see what we do. Let them come when you catch them. We will help them with rehabilitation. We will certify them. They'll go back to school. Then if you watch them, many of them have graduated. So from which, the university? Oh, from university. That's oh, yes, I know. Quite, many have doctors and nurses and even pilots today. Fantastic. That graduated from all. So that gave, that gave them, and they why don't we try? This is not to say that every one of them they sent to us do that. Mm. Two, three still fail, and then they expel them because they have tried enough. But they have seen a measure of success. So you're saying the first step mm. is not... It's not rustication. It's not punishment. Even if you're going to punish, let it be a lesser level. Let's say we suspend you mm. for a semester. Go to a so -so, so place or wherever you choose. Go and get rehabilitated. Bring a certification that you have stopped. We will take you back to school. We will, because what they, you know, schools today check at random. Yeah. So they are not called if you do well. And they'll be watching. Because what we say to them is when they come and finish with us, let a lecturer who has understanding be watching over them, report to the lecturer, maybe once in two weeks. How are you doing? How? Look at it, but don't begin to check them. Uh, maybe this guy, this guy. No, that's not the way. But then there's, uh, there's the other side of checking. Mm. 
when they check mm. randomly mm. and they find some of the uh, chemicals in their bloodstream, like THC, for instance, mm. which I found out can last about 30 days mm -hmm. within the system. I mean, what does that mean? And there are other sources of getting THC? Mm. You, you, you know, the interesting thing is, if you, rest, you know, these guys are smart. Yes. Catching out the university authorities. You know, some university authorities test, but they don't catch anyone, mm. depending on what the children, what these boys use. Mm. So, uh, don't say boys only. No, girls. Oh, uh -huh. girls. Yeah. No, you'll be, you'll be surprised that this is not limited to the men for. Mm. Women do as much drugs as men. Mm. So I, I use boys because in a general sense. Yes. So the, the, the thing is, if you find it true, you find it. But it doesn't mean that the person is on a regular use. Okay. Because if you use cannabis, if, if you don't use it within the next two weeks, you can still test positive. Hmm. And but you know some of these we are telling universities, do these things with caution. Because there are some natural tablets prescribed in the hospital that can make you have a false positive result okay. with this test. For instance, let me give you. If you take a leave, hmm. a leave is, is an analgesic. Yes. If you take it, if they test you, They'll mm. find THC. There will be a false positive for THC. Mm. And so just like other drugs, there are a, a few, the, we call them non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Okay. Some of them can give you a false positive for THC. So you can't then find THC and say, oh, surely this guy. You must interrogate the fact. First of all, test and find result. Well. Don't say this is what we found. How do you do this? Do you do this? Do so that you do not put the university in a difficult position because if the university now suspends and then somehow the student can prove that he doesn't use drugs, if they then do then subsequent they, tests, then it becomes yes. a problem for okay. the university. Then nobody will trust your judgment. So there's a need for caution. There's a need for caution. And you see, one of the things we also told the university, who catches someone to take for test? You need to be careful. There must be, the security can catch, but they must hand over to someone with more authority yeah. and understanding who can then say, we'll do this. Mm -hmm. If you don't do that, and it becomes the security who can just take, then they will make mistakes. Yeah. And what we also told you, all this noise about drugs, they don't grow in the universities. Mm -hmm. They got brought in. Yes. Some of the staff of the university are culpable. Mm. In the kitchen, in the laundry, they are, they are um, the marijuana the or person. Yes, all those things are people who can bring this to this. There's one particular student I saw last week who said to me that within his school, I won't mention the university, mm -hmm. it's a Christian university. He said in their school they use Colorado. Mm -hmm. So I asked him why. He said in the test kit of the university, Colorado does not show. Mm -hmm. It's not detected. So they use it on a grand scale. To get it within the campus from people who sell it as students starts from 2000, 2000, 2500 to 3000. So he now has a friend who is in a public institution who brings it, who gets it from outside for about 500 naira. So he brings it to him. But that guy was coming one day to supply it. Both of them got caught. He was tested, it was negative. Uh, although he used it, the other person who brought was positive because he uses other things. So he, he was suspended or expelled. So we said to him, we will rehabilitate him and do a letter to your investor that this is this and then give you a second chance. But public institutions don't really care. Mm. You come, I mean, you can imagine that publication in some of these public institutions, how would they be bothering themselves? But they have to, they have to bother mm -hmm. because they are producing people for the outside market. Mm. The same way the workplace Yes. needs to begin to bother today in terms of the people they employ. Because if you are not careful, you will employ them to your system and they begin to grow within your system. And the drug they take does not have to be some, it can be a no cost thing. If you see somebody in the office, for instance, who is taking a particular beverage, mm -hmm. put it on his table, the same bottle or container for like three hours, mm -hmm. is not, it, it must be strange to you. Mm -hmm. Or somebody has a flask, you know, there's this singer who sang one time, I want more water bottle. Yes. 
those things are not just street water bottle. Nobody goes to a party and carry water bottle. Yes. So you must know that there's something in it. Mm -hmm. um, so the, that, that I'm talking about this because we must begin to be observant of the current practices in our environment to help us take decisions. But this whole situation looks so bleak. Mm. Is there a way out? Oh, of course there is. It's you are bleak. optimistic? I'm optimistic. Look, let me tell you my basis for optimism, particularly now. Yes. And I must confess, having met General Marwa and worked with him a bit, I have a feeling, I'm strongly optimistic that if he is allowed to take the time and strategy as he wants to do, with the available resources, and then with his motivating his working, work staff, we will get results. It will be, but it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. What do I mean by that? It won't happen by magic. It will happen because we join up to work with him and it's every facet. You said something the other time in questioning me. Even within the law enforcement agencies, there are greater users of drugs yes. than the average society. I've been to joints where I saw them in uniform, take off their cap and they're shacking up. And that's why we have those accidents at the, uh, at the checkpoints and all those things. Mm. The custom must be involved in terms of interdiction. You know when people import? Yes. Was it end of last year? Somebody imported some containers of tramadol. Mm. Yes. If they were not caught at the port, they would have gone. When they said the number of tablets counted, if they were distributed across every Nigerian, each of us would have two to three tablets. Mm -hmm. You can then know the market, but I can show you, if that thing had worked past then, within two weeks, they'll be importing another set. Another one, yeah. Because, so, each, so, each component of society, you know, I mentioned parents, I mentioned mm -hmm. schools, yeah. I mentioned the workplace, yeah. then the church. And the mosque, too. And the mosque, the mm -hmm. religious body. You know why I'm particular about religious bodies? They see a lot more people than any component of our society. Yeah. So if the pastors know about drugs, they talk about, not in a judgmental sense, oh, if you take drugs, you go to hell. You are making the boys continue to take. Mm. Something, has, I have to, something has to take me to somewhere. Yes. Don't use that. We must use love and empathy and drive it home. And when they come to talk to us, it must be confidentially maintained. Mm -hmm. They might even say, don't tell my parents. Then don't call their parents because their parents give you shoes when they travel. You call them or money. Then you destroy. And the others will never tell you stop. Mm. It cuts across. The confidentiality must cut across every facet of the society. The church, the workplace, the schools, and everything. Now, to ask you a final question. Mm. How is CADAM funded? Ah, I thank you for asking me. <laughs> ah. It is one of the most difficult aspects of our operation. And I must say that if not for Mommy Jill, yeah. we would be struggling like anything. She visited us and saw our center in the rudimentary when we were. She said, and this is a rehab center. No wonder when I tell people to come, they don't want to come. They say, Bujero, and that is like a. Well, like, a like, uh, like a ship pen. Yes, so like. I said, Mommy, but what will we do? We've talked to everyone that we can talk to, no help. She then left, then called me. That was how she began to release Montreal until we built a good center. Yeah. She then spoke I to... I should come there. I haven't been there in a while. Oh, you should come. Yeah. And one of the things that I even want to do, interest big Nigerians, let them come and visit. Yeah. Then they can take a decision how they can help us. Yeah. Not necessarily if they want to give money. They can build certain centers, yeah. they can give us equipment, they can give us vehicles, the things that we need. They don't have to give us money, so they don't say somebody want to chop their money. But it's a place for people to visit. Even when people want to have ceremonies, like a poker birthday, they can say, every form for me I give to this center, mm -hmm. or come and uh, help us. But finance is a major issue. Mm -hmm. The church gives us money which today is like what we use to pay salaries to buy food because the program is free. Yes. The program in Equa is free. We don't charge a dime for it. And mm -hmm. they spend a year. Mm -hmm. We house them, we clothe them, we treat them, we do all those. So we feed them. Mm -hmm. So we need help. Mm -hmm. um, if we get help, we'll be, we'll, we'll be on top of it. We'll do much more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So 
Call for help. Call for help. Talk to the reporter. Ah, I wish today, if anybody watched these days, you go to our website, www.cadamonline.org. No, sorry, mm -hmm. www.cadam.org.ng. That's our website. Yeah. And then our phone number is there, oh, it's 171103, I think 995. Our, phone, our office is in Ikeja. I, I get in the five Yusuf close off Sadiku Street, off Amaro, behind Zenith Bank. Mm -hmm. Come and visit with us. If you come, you talk to us, we'll take you to visit. You will see these people in flight. You see the, the, the faces of addiction. And then you can see there is hope. That's why I'm happy. And I'm pleased to say to you that it's not all bleak. Okay. It looks bleak today, but there's light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you very much. Doc. Thank you. Papa. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. My guest today on Timeless Conversations has been Dr. Dukun Adereji, an altruistic person, totally selfless. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll much. follow up on what Kadam is doing. We'll come there. We'll be glad. We'll come we'll be there. Glad. We'll come there. Maybe we can do a special one. I think you on should. Site. I think you should. And site. maybe also get yes. somebody like General Mara to talk to yes. us. Yeah, know. we'll reach out to him. We'll right. reach out to him. Thank you very much for watching. See you some other time. Bye. Hope you enjoyed the news. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to hit the notification button so you get notified about fresh news updates.